Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Morcronin. I'm Brett Ewer. And today we're discussing the future of Bloomberg. That means we'll get into how Mike Bloomberg performed in the most recent Democratic debate, what makes his political strategy so unique compared to the other candidates, and how Bloomberg is likely to fare in the Democratic primary, as well as potentially the 2020 general election. So to start, Brett, What's different about Bloomberg's political strategy? What makes it so unconventional compared to the strategy of the other candidates? Um, So something to understand going into going into this topic is that every political campaign is starved for cash. They are always asking for money. I'm sure you guys have, you know, you've seen the Bernie meme where he's like, once again, I'm asking for you. Yeah. I mean, constantly, there's a constant churn. They're always trying to fundraise. Campaigns are pretty expensive. Um, you know, you have you have staff that you need to hire um, all the way down from, you know, field organizers who are organizing a district within a state all the way up to national campaign staff, surrogates. You know, you have to fly people around. You know, you, you might even have to charter private planes. So it's very expensive. Um, and that means that you rely a lot on earned media. And so earned media, meaning um, media that you generate, media coverage that you generate from doing something Mm -hmm. uh, and from outreach to the traditional press and to traditional Mm -hmm. outlets like CNN, you know, MSNBC, Fox um, or newspapers. So that's generally how campaigns work. They need to generate momentum so that they can get earned media and then it kind of feeds on itself. But with Bloomberg, it's it's fascinating because I don't think this is unorthodox um he's just able to buy space in people's heads Mm -hmm. he's able to buy advertising um i'm sure you i'm sure everyone who's listening to this has seen a mike bloomberg ad my youtube is cluttered with them youtube and twitter i just i have to (laughs) have to like cancel out of them so often and instagram Um, oh yeah and instagram i mean he's able to buy paid media. And the effect of that is he's renting space in people's heads. Uh, and, and we've seen that reflected in polling numbers. He's now second nationally behind Bernie. Uh, that's wild. That's yeah. the, the only time I can think of in recent political history where that has happened was, uh, I think in 1992, Ross Perot, uh, when he ran as an independent or as third party, he just bought a half hour of primetime uh, television and just went off. Right. Uh, well, apparently Bloomberg. also for Bloomberg's mayoral campaign, he did a similar strategy where he just, even as a Republican at the time, he was able to beat a Democrat in New York just by buying up a tremendous amount of space on all the airwaves and all the media outlets. But it's also interesting that it's not like he's been spending this money for months and months and months like the other candidates, he made his strategy all about Super Tuesday. Like he didn't even care about the Iowa caucus or the New Hampshire caucus. He's just like, look, I'm gonna put all my marbles into this Super Tuesday with, you know, which all the big, the big states or a lot of them vote on the Democratic primary. And that strategy seems to be working, especially because it seems like he made the calculation that Joe Biden may fade in popularity right around this time. And then he's the guy standing in wait who can be the hero and be the guy that can come and defeat Trump. At least that's how he's been positioning himself. Yeah, his consultants and I, you know, maybe I shouldn't just chalk it up to his consultants. He might have had a part in, in his own strategy, but uh, but they realized rightfully so that the actual benefit of those first primaries and caucuses. So in order, Iowa caucuses, New Hampshire primary, Nevada caucuses, South Carolina primary. The main benefit of those is to generate media attention and then momentum around a candidate. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you don't need that momentum, um, if you can just, if you're funding your own campaign, you don't need that momentum and media coverage and then fundraising dollars that come with that. If you just short circuit the system, go right for the dollars. Yeah, you don't need to focus on those first four states. They don't have that many pledged delegates anyway. Um, you know, the big nut is, is, uh, is, you know, the Super Tuesday states. Right. So, and what do yeah. you think about his staying out of the debates until the most recent one? 
that stra- that part of the strategy? Well, I think it's, you know, there are positives and negatives with the positives. He's able to just put his ads out and flood people's heads with the message that he wants. Right. Um, the negative is that he doesn't get to knife fight with the other candidates and, and, you know, really learn how to do that. I mean, I know he's done that on, on, you know, the New York stage and that's certainly, you know, but I'm sure that's stressful and that, you know, he's been in debates before that are challenging, but nothing like a national debate. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's, it, it's so funny because I was looking back through our, our text history, you and me, Brett, and you've made so many predictions that have been spot on. Like, I mean, we've been covering this for a long time. Like, I think the first future Democratic Party was like six months ago or something like that. But you've been calling that Bernie's going to be sort of the leader for this whole time. And it only really has come to pass recently. And you also said going into the debate that it's going to be, you know, he's usually okay in debates with good faith debaters, ones that wouldn't call him names like Trump would, but this one is going to be nasty, bring popcorn. And it, it really was. It was like next level cutthroat. I mean, I've, I've heard some pundits describe it as a circular firing squad. And it seemed like in the first 45 minutes, it was, you know, Bloomberg was in the center of that circle. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on how you thought Bloomberg did in the debate, you know, in the first 45 minutes and then, you know, throughout it. He did not do very well at all. I mean, I don't want to overstate it, but man, he got trampled. That first, you know, the first salvo I think came from uh, from Senator Warren mm-hmm. um, when she she did that sort of misdirect where she said, you know, we need to we're running against a billionaire who, uh, you know, I think I think it was like we're running against a billionaire who called someone a horse faced like right. lesbian. Well, I have the exact so, quote right here actually. She said, yeah. "Let's remember who we're running against." a billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And I'm not talking about Trump. I'm talking about Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> yeah, that that's brutal. And yeah. it, I mean, it made for great TV. And, you know, putting aside the point of, you know... What, May not even be true. Yeah, I, I mean, or, or the point that she's making. I mean, even just setting that aside, in terms of debate um, strategy, that was, that was pretty good right out of the gate, just launching into the guy um into into bloomberg and and you know he should have his team should have expected this i mean you can't get you can't just avoid all debates right at some i was amazed that he didn't have a better prepared answer for that because it was the most obvious point that he's going to have to answer to is hey you've had women come forward that want to speak out about their experience working at bloomberg why don't you release them from their NDAs and actually let them talk openly about it. And if you recall, Trump was asked a very similar question in the 2016 election where Megyn Kelly said, you know, you've called women, you know, fat, horse face, da, 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 like just lists all the things he said about women. And then Trump just goes only Rosie O'Donnell and everyone just bursts into like laughter and just surprise and they can't believe it. And that was like, such a skillful maneuver, whether or not you think it's ethical, it was like a great way to deflect the criticism and change change the focus. But with Bloomberg, rather than doing something like that and you know taking a page out of Trump's playbook and being unapologetically himself, which I think would have played much better, instead of that, he had kind of like a weak apology where he's like, yeah, well, people sign NDAs and you know it's up to them if they want to stay in them. And then Elizabeth Warren's like, okay, so if they don't want to stay in them, then will you let them speak out? And he's like, well, no, because they signed the document. And that's like such a weak response. Like, how could you not have come up with a better answer for that? Yeah, and I I think the phrase was, we'll just have to, or we'll have to live with that. Yeah. And is what he ended with, which is not a great response in the slightest. Now, keeping in mind that he's kind of in a tricky point here just because he's running for the Democratic nomination and and the Democratic Party base just isn't going to handle that. They're just not going to accept that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think there is really any way out of that for him. It would take a lot of creative public relations minds better than me. Well, I think Uh, I think his like the proper response, I think, would have been something like, 
look, I'm the only one who started a business. I, you know, I shouldn't be lectured on how a business should operate. Every business that has more than, you know, a handful of employees has NDAs as part of their agreements. And especially now that we're in a presidential race, everyone who used to work at Bloomberg has more of an incentive to say things about me so they can get their own fame or whatever. So I'm not going to release them from their NDAs because that wouldn't be good business. And let me tell you how we can operate the, you know, the country under good business principles because I'm the only guy who knows how to do that. Like he should have said something yeah. along those lines. I think if he made it more about his business and the operations, mm -hmm. then it would be it would be less of a personal uh, it, it would be less personal baggage. It would still be bad. It right. would be you presided over an organization that facilitated, you know, I think it's like 64 sexual harassment um, accusations, you know, so so that so that would not be great. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard, you know, I. I, I I think tying it to the business is a good tactic. Um, I simply just don't see, this is a situation where you can only just mitigate damage. Right, you know? right. Um, I mean, it, it really, if he wanted to, he could have doubled down and then pivoted and said, yeah, it happened. And you know what? It's happened in all your campaigns too. He, right, you know, he could have, right. he could have, uh, he could have called out, uh, I believe Senator Sanders campaign had a, had an issue where some staff alleged sexual harassment. Um, there's definitely been sexual harassment accusations uh, le leveled at uh, Joe Biden's campaign, or, or mm -hmm. I believe at him. Um, or he could have levied it at you know any number of the candidates. He could have pivoted, uh, but he did not handle it well at all. Yeah, I thought the other issue that he didn't handle well was the stop and frisk question. Which is also something that was one of the most predictable questions that he was going to have to answer. Hey, you did this stop and frisk policy. It was traumatizing for a whole generation of African Americans and minorities in New York. What say you about that policy? And he could have said something that was more just about like, like, look, like my focus was to stop crime. And I've, you know, learned since then, like, it could have been like a strong response along the same principles. But instead, again, it was a weak apology where he was basically like, look, you know, I'm embarrassed about stop and frisk. And, you know, I'm, I've apologized for it. And like, it just, uh, that may play in private circles, but on a debate stage, it just doesn't sound like a strong answer that you would want to hear from the next president of the United States. I think had he been smart about it, he would have publicized more of the work that he did afterward to try to rectify the situation with, uh, you know, the affected communities. I think he, you know, namely mostly black people and brown people. Mm -hmm. So if he wanted to uh, really insulate himself from that criticism earlier, he would have met with civic leaders from those organizations. And he did make some point. And he has, to that. He, but he didn't he, say about, he didn't talk about it on the debate. Right. And he, and he didn't, he didn't get out in front of the problem early mm -hmm. enough. I mean, had he gotten a list of all of those people to endorse him, or at least put out a letter saying he is fully contrite and we believe him and he is sincere in his apology for this horrible policy, then he could say, yeah, I screwed up. And, you know, the, the people that were that represent groups that were affected acknowledge this. So I've learned. And, you know, then he can say, let's move on so that we can ensure, you know, civil rights and civil liberties for everyone, et cetera. But, right. uh, you know, at a certain point, one has to question whether he's running for the right party, you know, <laughs> like his policies, he put those in place when he was elected as a Republican, right? And not long ago. So like, he's gonna have and to answer. Pete, and Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg even said something to that effect. He's like, we need someone who's an actual Democrat. I think he said those words. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny, because behind the scenes, I think Bloomberg's been making all the right moves. Like he like while other candidates were focusing on, you know, their ground game in Iowa and all these like very small pawn chess moves on the chessboard, he's been not only donating to a lot of Democratic candidates, but also to a lot of charities and causes and all of these groups that have a lot of sway, like like Emily's List, which is the biggest pro-choice group. And 
he's been able to get all of these leaders, especially women leaders and, uh, and leaders in the African-American communities to, if they don't endorse him, at least not endorse another candidate. Because, you know, the New York Times reported that it's like his, the gravitational force of his money has really made ripples in the world of democratic politics, where if you're someone who has an important cause and you really want your cause to succeed, then you know, speaking out against Mike Bloomberg is probably not going to help because he could write a check that would just make or break your cause. And in the Democratic, you know, in the field of congressional candidates, he donated to 21 of the Democratic candidates who won in the 2018 congressional election. 15 of those candidates were women. So I think he has done a good job of getting out ahead of, you know, the, the issues that he's had or the questions that are brought up against him as it relates to women and his treatment of minorities. But that needs to come also with strong answers where you you lay down the facts and you make it current and you move people away from all of these past things that may have happened, you know, 15 years ago and you bring it up to the present. Yeah, yeah. So often the real power of money in politics is not buying an affirmative move. It's buying silence uh, and it's making the right donations so that you don't become a target because in the eyes of legislators or any other policymakers, they have a limited amount of time and resources. They have to choose what their focus will be, you know, the, the, the practicalities of enforcement. And so if you donate strategically, you will be effectively buying, buying silence uh, or at least buying a blind eye. And so I think that that's kind of what he's going for. Um, he donated $5 million to Stacey Abrams uh, Foundation in Georgia. Uh, he also donated quite a bit of money to the Center for American Progress, CAP, right. which is a, a liberal think tank uh, in D.C. And I, I believe, and don't quote me on this, I have to check, but uh, CAP had included a pretty scathing report on stop and frisk and civil liberties infringements uh, in New York City presided added over by Mike Bloomberg. Um, and then that part of the report was cut. Right. So right. there's a lot of shady stuff going on here that suggests that he's not buying an endorsement. Rather, he's 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 buying uh, he's buying silence. And in fact, he did. Uh, there are reports that he went around to different, uh, you know, large individual donors. And he said, I don't want your donation. I just want you to not donate to anyone else. So, you know, less of breathing all the oxygen in the room and more like lighting all the oxygen in the room on fire so no one else can breathe. Right. <laughs> yeah. And he just yeah. has like a big gas mask and tank or, I, you know, I don't know. He's in a scuba suit. That's a great <laughs> Like Bloomberg in a scuba suit. Yeah. So, so I guess given all that, do you pretty much think that the other candidates are not worth considering at this point that it's pretty much down to Bernie or Bloomberg? Like, and I guess for first, do you think that any of the other moderates have a chance in the moderate lane aside from Bloomberg? And then we can talk a little bit about how he would fare against some of the progressives. The moderate lane is in a, an interesting situation right now where they are, you know, let's assume that all of the moderate candidates would rather support each other than Bernie Sanders and the left wing of the party. Let's let's assume that. I don't actually think that's true. I think that their supporters, uh, it would be a mixed bag. You know, I think some of Elizabeth Warren's supporters would support Bernie. I think some might support Klobuchar. I think some might support uh, Buttigieg. I think I think it's it's variable, and we can't just assume, like so many cable news outlets do, that there's a moderate lane and there's a left lane, and mm -hmm. that they they coalesce. Um, it's much more. It's much more. Um, uh, Nuanced. Variable, nuanced, yeah. yeah. So I think that let's, you know, assume that, that it is monolithic like that. Um, they're in kind of a prisoner's dilemma kind of game right now where all of the moderate lane want to stay in because they know that some of them are going to have to drop out mm -hmm. and that they're assuming that they're going to get all of those votes. So, you know, Biden has fall, fallen in the polls um, and Buttigieg has, has risen. I think he's assuming that a lot of the Biden support will go to him. Um, so it's kind of like a big game of chicken right now. 
and they're not really doing themselves any favors if their end goal is the enactment of moderate policy. They're not doing themselves any favors by sticking it out. Um, the safe bet would be for some of the moderates to drop out and tell their supporters vote for, you know, the leading moderate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I saw one person say that Bloomberg coming in to the moderate lane was the best thing that could have ever happened to Bernie because he's splitting totally. up all that support. And let's let's not even look at it from a quantitative or pseudo quantitative, you know, standpoint. Let's look at it from a messaging standpoint. Bernie and to a lesser extent, Elizabeth Warren, Senator Warren, but but both of them need a character foil. Donald Trump mm -hmm. is pretty good. But he's so repugnant to almost everyone that someone can find, you know, some issue with him. Some any decent person can find some contrast. But with Mike Bloomberg, he comes in as a technocratic solver mm -hmm. of issues who has 60 billion dollars at his command. It just it just proves <laughs> Senator Sanders and Senator Warren's point that <laughs> a guy can just waltz into the waltz into the Democratic um, you know, race by virtue of just having a lot of money. I mean, it's just, it's such a powerful narrative right. move. If I were writing a TV show, I'd say, no, this isn't realistic. A billionaire just decides to run against the guy who's decrying billionaires. No. Um, <laughs> it, it's yeah. just, it's a little Although I will say that I don't know if any billionaire could pull it off. Like, I think part of what makes his strategy so powerful is that he's so plugged into the flow of information I mean, I was just talking to my buddy who works on Wall Street in New York, and he said that every person on Wall Street who works in investment banking or sales and trading pays $30,000 a year to Bloomberg to get real-time financial data. Every single person who works in that firm. Yep. And some of these biggest firms, they tried to live without Bloomberg's financial data for like six months and it was a complete disaster. So in a very real sense, Bloomberg and his company control the flow of financial information, which is a very crucial part of the entire economy, which makes his influence just that much more powerful. And it's, it's even more than that. Let's even just discount the fact that he has a media outlet that puts out media right, right. in very, you know, for, for various you know, uh, niche issues. I know that in my, uh, industry, you know, in, in influence, uh, Bloomberg government is used widely, uh, by lobbying firms and PR firms. So oh, that I you don't can, know about that. yeah, Bloomberg government. It's, it's, it's not like the Bloomberg terminal for finances, but it has directories and services. So I could look up, um, you know, I don't want to make this an ad for Bloomberg government, but it, but it's a great it's a great uh, system. You know, you can look up regulatory comments from uh, agencies. You can look up state legislation. It's very comprehensive. So, yeah, I think that underscores your point that he controls so much information. His resources are you know, his, his unquantifiable resources extend beyond just his his billions. So let's assume that the current polling is a good indicator for what's to come and that it does come down to Bernie and Bloomberg as the two viable Democratic candidates. What do you see as the potential weakness for Bernie, strength for Bernie, and the weakness for Bloomberg and the strength for Bloomberg? Like, how do you think that will play out? I mean, I'll start with the strengths and weaknesses of Senator Sanders for Bernie. Uh, you know, I think his there's there's the weakness you know there are always the issues that are listed with him that he purportedly hasn't done anything in congress even though that's not really true but but mm -hmm. let's let's assume that that message rings out that he hasn't done anything in congress that he's crazy that he's a socialist that he wants to own your toothbrush or whatever um that he's you know a, a deadbeat dad and that uh the college that his wife was president of tanked and that she committed some sort of malfeasance. Let's assume, you know, those mm -hmm. are those. Oh, and then also the health records thing, which I'm sure, you, you know, you've heard of. Right. He won't release his full health records. Yeah. Right. Um, which is a whole that's worth a whole other segment. Uh -huh. But um, but, you know, I think those those could could certainly play uh, or, you know, come to play. And then people might cite, um, you know, his past support for uh, South American uh, you know, groups fighting against the Contras, right? In Nicaragua, you had the Sandinistas and the Contras. Um, some people will, you know, they'll, they'll, 
cling on to the, you know, he's a socialist message and, and really go with it. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty, you know, we can't discount those weaknesses. I think that there are rebuttals to them, but I'm not paid by the Sanders campaign. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think in terms of strengths, his strength is uh, his platform is, com is composed of universalist policies. So he's advancing pretty bold policy proposals that are pretty popular. I mean, across yeah. the country, Medicare for All has 70 percent support, uh, support uh, and quite a few people are dealing with medical you know, health care issues. So he seems to be tapping into uh, a s stream of discontent uh, that people need someone to voice and he, and he seems to be voicing it well. So, you know, that's, that's certainly a strength. And then also he, he's strong on, uh, you know, trade issues that would, um, support his candidacy in Midwestern states, you know, in what was the, the blue firewall, right? Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, there was a poll that came out today actually, uh, that found that, uh, while he's, he would be down in in Wisconsin against Trump. He would be up in Michigan and Pennsylvania. Hmm. Uh, and if he had both of those and then Nebraska's variable electoral college vote that uh, they would be tied 269, wow. 269, which is a whole other. That's fascinating. So right. so those are his strengths, um, you know, broad universalist policy and the fact that we've talked about this before, that he's fairly authentic uh, yeah. and people like that even if it's he's a curmudgeonly old grandpa that mm -hmm. says the same old thing and yells at you people like that yeah you know, they like yeah. someone who's real that's why they elected Donald Trump who is a game show host that admitted to sexual assault <laughs> uh, you know i mean uh, now yep. for bloomberg yeah sorry i was going to say I, and what about for bloomberg so yeah let's hear it yeah for bloomberg i think his his strengths or i'll, I'll go with his weaknesses first his weaknesses um, are that he's very, uh, he lacks any charisma. I mean, if you saw him up on the stage, he was mm -hmm. answering questions like a businessman, not like a statesman or a politician. Mm -hmm. He does not have the gift of gab. He doesn't, he just doesn't seem to be good with rhetoric just based off of what I've seen. Um, he doesn't have that. He's not particularly inspiring or interesting. Um, his story doesn't really seem to be interesting or relatable. Great. Mm -hmm. So he was yeah. a guy that got billions of dollars and became very powerful. Oh, that happens to how many people <laughs> in this country? I mean, so yeah. he's 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 not very relatable. He's going to have to answer at some point for his the pictures that tie him to uh, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, right. That's well, apparently happen. no one can find uh, Ma Madame Maxwell. She's like dropped off the face of the earth. So we could do a whole episode on that whole mystery. <laughs> But yeah, that is a concern. stuff just continues to melt my brain. Um, but, you know, he's going to have to answer for that. I think that his his weaknesses are pretty manifest there, as well as um, his weaknesses on all of the things that we just mentioned. I mean, the NDAs, mm -hmm. um, you know, the sexual harassment, the uh, and also stop and frisk. You know, that's that's not going to go away. It, it really yeah. isn't. Um, so those are, you know, those are the big weaknesses I see. Right. Strengths. He has limitless resources, limitless resources. And and I'm of the camp that says that the way to win an election is not just by trying to win the slim number, the slim margin of voters who, who are call themselves independents and swing between the two parties. It's you need to tap into the people that don't vote. Right. That's a huge constituency. That's the largest constituency. <laughs> is not. Yeah. Is, it's it's people that don't vote because yeah, it's more like people vote to, for American Idol than the election when American Idol was super popular. <laughs> exactly, and 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 something you know to give Bloomberg and his campaign some credit, um, he has the resources to just reach the non-information voter or the low-information voter, and buy space in their head through advertising. He can mm -hmm. flood the airwaves um, and he can also gobble up political talent. So like I know that there have been reports that uh, low level races in Texas, for example, like for constable, like county constable or whatever, 
they can't find any political operatives, like young people in their 20s or 30s, to work on those campaigns because Mike Bloomberg is guaranteeing payment through December and he's paying ridiculous salaries. Here's an example. Here's an example. He's paying $6,000 a month for a field organizer. Field organizers in most campaigns, I'm speaking here for mostly federal congressional campaigns, are probably getting paid mm, 24 to 30 K a year. So if he's, yeah. So if he's guaranteeing nine months pay going forward, nine months pay at, at six K, you're talking 54 grand and you know, for the entire year it would be 72. He's, he's more than doubling. Pay. Yeah. State directors are getting something, you know, people that control an entire state operation, they're getting paid something like 350 K that's unheard of in politics. Right. So, it's like he's basically taking the deep state and making it work for him, <laughs> which is really smart. And the other smart thing is that it's easy to hate on an oligarch billionaire, especially if you're a progressive. But if that oligarch billionaire is supporting all the causes you care about, then it makes it a little bit more complex for you to just diss him publicly. There are enough people that aren't concerned about the policies, but are more concerned about the procedural issues that and that's being very nice and charitable. It's a charitable description for Donald Trump's administration and what they've done. The, right. there, there, there's a segment of voters who care more about the maintaining the image of the office. Um, yeah, totally. And, you know, the symbolism and all of that. Uh, and that's why they're, you know, turned off by Trump or disgusted by him. And Bloomberg would pretty much, he buys that kind of dignity. Totally. Yeah. And, and one thing that else that I think is smart is that, or not smart, but one thing that's different about past elections is that I feel like in the past, if you had a really damning clip of you of something you said or did in the past, it would have a real impact. But in the post-Trump era, it just has way less of an impact. Like we saw it early on with Joe Biden, where he had some pretty bad things that he had done and said back in the day, and no one really cared. And especially among black supporters who were some of the ones that you would think would be the most outraged about the policies Joe Biden had in place. They're like, look, that's in the past. We care about what's going to actually happen now and in the future. That's what's important. And I feel like for Bloomberg, it's going to be a similar thing where, yeah, he may have had bad policies or said or done bad things in the past. But what I really care about is what's going to happen to me and my family in the next, you know, four years. And so I think that probably works to Bloomberg's favor. But I want to get into now, maybe we can take a quick break and then do the future scenarios because I want to get your predictions, you know, not only on what you think would be the best, worst and most likely outcome, but also just how you think it's going to play out, you know, we're almost at Super Tuesday and how you think that it can play out and whether super delegates come into play and, you know, what could happen in those scenarios. So let's get into that. All right, Brett. So let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. So from now until the election, what would be the worst sequence of events in your mind that would put America in the worst position? I always preface this by giving a disclaimer, which is that anything can happen. We are years, political years away from the actual general and, and you know, centuries away from the uh, from November. So anything can happen. Uh, you know, I don't discount anything, but my worst is that part time fighting and jockeying for a position that there is no clear front runner or there's no acknowledgement of a clear front runner. Um, you know, someone gets to the convention with a plurality. They don't make a majority on the first vote of pledged delegates. The super delegates come in and weigh, um, way in favor of, you know, a, a, a candidate that is palatable to their tastes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that candidate runs a milk toast campaign that sounds like it's, you know, canned press release and all that. 
one that doesn't have any real emotion or feeling or, you know, in, inspiration behind it. And then they just get run into the ground by Donald Trump. I read today that the Fed is considering rate cuts to the prime rate, which usually sends the stock market soaring. And, you know, the perception of how the economy is doing uh, oftentimes influences uh, to the benefit of the incumbent, uh, influences popular opinion to the benefit of the incumbent, so to the you know benefit right. of Donald Trump, uh, and so you know I think, I think effectively a replay of 2016 is the worst case that could happen. I also not to step on it, but I also think that's more likely than not going right. to be the case. Well, we'll get into that with the most likely, but yeah, I, I have a similar worst case where. I think in 2016, it wasn't so much that Donald Trump won as that Hillary Clinton lost, that a lot of people stayed home. and Because Trump's numbers are actually pretty similar to George W. Bush or Mitt Romney. Like It's not like he actually brought out that much more support. It was really just that a lot of the Democrats that needed to come out for Hillary to win didn't come out. So I would say in my worst case, it's that Bernie wins a plurality of delegates, but it's not quite enough and the super delegates tip the balance in Bloomberg's favor so he wins but a lot of Bernie voters stay home and we get four more years of Trump and uh, I think you know there's another scenario where for instance you know Bloomberg wins or sorry where, where Bernie wins and then a lot of moderates stay home or, you know, maybe we don't get some of those moderate Republicans or independents or people that typically stay home to get fired up and come out because they've, you know, they believe that Bernie is a commie and the economy will tank under him. And, and I guess sure. for myself, like, I really like Bernie's authenticity and I consider him an American hero. And I really think a lot of the policies he's, he's putting forward, especially Medicare for all and actually doing something about, you know, the global climate change. These are really important policies and I believe we should enact them. But my concern is that he will, that, that just by the perceptions of him, it will result in us going into a recession or possibly even a depression. And it may end up being that in the long run, it ends up strengthening America and we have a difficult adjustment period, but then people are a lot happier when they have their own health care and they don't have to worry as much about going bankrupt. But my other big concern, I guess, with Bernie is the foreign policy issue. And mm -hmm. because, you know, he's pretty much wants to pull out of wars and he's pretty dovish in his policies. So I'm concerned that if we have someone like Bernie, it may create some vacuums on the world stage that may be filled by countries like China and Russia. And it's hard to foresee like all the future implications of that. But I guess like when I'm just thinking of like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like to me, the worst thing that can happen is the economy tanks, whether it's justified or not, because people are worried about the policies Bernie may implement. And the other worst case would be that something, you know, we've seed a lot of control on the world stage to countries like China and Russia because we have maybe two dovish policies. So, yeah, yeah, I, I could see that. You know, the, this, the economy thing is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. Because right. it's because it's like, oh, he's going to, you know, he's going to Bernie doesn't advocate for real socialism. He calls himself a, a democratic socialist. But in terms of actual parlance he's a social democrat mm -hmm. um you know he's not calling for ownership of all businesses by workers uh, you know th but that's a problem with that's a problem that he has made himself with his own branding yeah. um so yeah i you know i can understand that um he's not going to call for the confiscation or nationalization of you know huge uh industries other than the health and healthcare industry that seems to be part right. of you know Plus, most um, of, you know, we're still dealing with a Republican-led Senate, so it's unlikely that a lot of these would be passed anyways. And it's sort of like how Trump came in and he had these really bold policies, but then we ended up only getting part of the way there. Like, it's not like we deported every illegal immigrant and Mexico paid for the wall, but we built some of the wall and we deported some immigrants. So with a similar thing, Bernie may result in 
you know, progress that's made because he's willing to share his vision for what it, what the country could be. Yeah. In order to get to some sort of middle ground where you can find consensus, you ha you have to go to a negotiating table, a bargaining table, asking for more than you really want. And AOC said this, I think, this past week or a few days ago. She said she would be fine with something like a public option mm -hmm. rather yeah. than Medicare for all. You, you can't say that out loud. I don't think she realized that. You, you can't say that part out loud. You have to think that. Um, but I have no doubt that the American health insurance industry or the hospitals or, or any or pharma or whatever, any of the interested players who maintain or who, who benefit from the status quo, uh, I have no doubt that they're going to fight tooth and nail if Medicare for all is actually pushed for. And what will come from that is something that is is sane and humane. I don't know, like the German healthcare system, which has a public, which has a public option and comes yeah. along fine with private insurance, um, and people don't go bankrupt from having cancer. Right. Totally. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's bring it to the best case scenario. Best case scenario. So, what's your best case sequence of events from now until the 2020 election? Well, here, here's what I would hope is that uh, after Super Tuesday, Bernie comes out as the clear front runner, uh, even beyond his status now, uh, and enough of the moderates drop out and enough of the vote shifts to Bernie's way that he gets just an outright majority mm -hmm. so that there is the, so that the superdelegates don't matter. They only matter after the first vote, the first round of voting at the DNC. Um, if no one reaches the majority threshold, which is 1,990 delegates, uh, then superdelegates come into play. I hope they don't come into play because then that brings up nasty questions of party unity. Yeah. And then I hope from there they move on because I do believe that both the moderate and the left wing of the Democratic Party despise President Trump. Mm -hmm. And I hope that everyone could unify uh, and then move forward and, and campaign vigorously and go out and canvas and phone bank and do everything that's necessary. Who do you think so, would be the right VP candidate for Bernie? AOC? I mean, that's tough. I think it would all come down. It, no, it would not be AOC. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Um, it's got to be someone probably from someone the more Midwest. moderate, maybe like uh, Amy Klobuchar, for instance. Yeah, I think in fact, I think she would probably not be a bad choice. Um, it would, it would most likely be a moderate woman from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard that someone like Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin would mm -hmm. be a great choice. Wisconsin is in play right now. Um, Trump is leading there, but that's a seat. That's a, those are electoral votes that the, the Democrats need. Um, he could get someone from Michigan. Um, but generally I think to maintain Party, party unity, he would need a, a moderate woman. Right. Um, it could be someone like Stacey Abrams from Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Georgia is certainly not in play, but I think enough people, uh, you know, across the Midwest would, would recognize that gesture, you know, totally. that he chose a moderate too. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think it would allay some fears about his health. Um, if he chose, a, if he chose a moderate, uh, and a woman, because then both of those constituencies, constituencies quite cynically could say, hey, listen, if Bernie dies, then, you know, we, we have the first woman president, <laughs> right. you know. Um, so, you know, I think that's that's probably who his VP choices would be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, my my second best case scenario is pretty much the scenario you outlined, because I agree. It's the most important thing is that whoever wins wins decisively and so we have a unified party going into the election personally mm -hmm. i i would prefer bloomberg over bernie although i would mm -hmm. prefer either of them over trump for sure so in my scenario it would be that bloomberg wins big and as a result we actually avoid the worst case which would be like a recession or a depression and i think the way that that could become reality is if if, if uh, Bloomberg continues to fight hard against Trump, because I think that's been his strongest point. And he actually has this one quote, which I thought was the single most effective thing he has said in public, which is that, President Trump, we know many of the same people in New York. 
yeah. behind your back they laugh at you and call you a carnival barking clown they know you inherited a fortune and squandered it with stupid deals and incompetence i have the record and the resources to defeat you and i will so i thought that was just like if he can stick to that message and not get into the nitty gritty of his past history or getting into these little mini dog fights with the other candidates and really focus on look I'm basically the real version of Trump. Like, I'm truly self-funded. I'm truly a self-made billionaire. I'm truly someone who can manage the entire economy and do deals with business leaders and really get things things done. Then I think that is a very strong positioning for him going into the general. You know, Bernie definitely has the edge as far as just a groundswell of support. So I think that is a big advantage he has. But I wonder if, like, you know, in the general election how either of them would fare against Trump because let's let's be honest like Trump is a really skilled public speaker and he's a skilled bully who knows he's a, he's essentially a stand-up comedian who's really good on his feet and yeah. so I you know I yeah I'm not saying well I guess maybe now let's get into the most likely scenario because I want to hear what you think is most likely to happen what you predict will happen I just want to add before that that yeah. I agree with you that Bloomberg does at least he tries to get under Trump's skin, which is what you're supposed to do. I mean, the guy's fighting. You don't fight. You fight fire with fire. Like right. if Donald Trump is going to make fun of you, make fun of him. There's so much material there. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, his, he, his other response that I loved is when he, you know, he kept calling Bloomberg mini Mike and making fun of his how, how short he is. And then he said, you know, Donald Trump in New York, we measure height from the neck up. Yeah, which is right. like about how intelligent you are. Like, I thought that was a great. Yeah, or, or just call him Dumpy Don. When you're dealing with Donald Trump, you just have to bully him back. He's a bully. Right. The way that you deal with a bully is not to be like, oh, t- teacher, like something's wrong. You know, you yeah, don't do that. Yeah. You, just, you, you talk shit. I mean, that's the only that's way a bully will respect you also. Yeah. But. Yeah. All right. So, well, let's get yeah. into the most likely scenario. What do you predict is going to happen? Most likely scenario. All right, so I know I kind of stepped on it earlier, but I think what's going to happen is that uh, Bernie's going to maintain his front runner status, and he's going to get a lot of pledged delegates. I would, I expect above a thousand, probably around fifteen or sixteen hundred. That's not enough. Um, that's gonna, not going to be enough to clinch the nomination. He'll probably end up getting something like forty percent of the pledged delegates which is big. Um, but then I think enough of the moderates are going to stick around and they're going to, it's going to be a brokered convention. You know, mm-hmm. they are going to make deals and swap delegates and the super delegates are going to come into play. We don't even know who they're really supporting. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times, so to be clear, super delegates include elected officials. So members of Congress who are part of the democratic party, um, democratic governors, I think Democratic All the living secret- presidents, too. All the living presidents. I think some secretaries of state. It, they're high elected officials. There are also just like DNC committee members who are also included. These are just people who have been in the party that for a long time that are respected. Like, I don't know what his official position is, but I know that um, I think it's George Norcross from southern New Jersey. I'm not really sure if he even has a title, but he is like, he's known as a, he's a political player in South Jersey. Hmm. Um, you know, he's a member. So all of these uh, folks will weigh in and vote for, I imagine on the second round, an institutional favorite, someone like Biden or maybe Pete Buttigieg uh, or, mm-hmm. or, you know, someone, they will hand it to a moderate. Uh, and then that moderate, I think, is going to have to deal with the blowback of 40% of the party being spurned in effect, right. um, having, you know, a front runner status turned on its head. And then they're going to have to really campaign hard to make sure that they can get those people to stick. Um, right. because you know, a and lot the super of the delegates, support- they're only 15% though. Right. So they would, you would have to be close enough. Like if Pete Buttigieg is only gets 10% of delegates, then it's not like he would have a chance of winning at, at a brokered convention. Right. No, well, it, it really depends on which candidates tell their pledged delegates to vote for what other candidates. Oh, I so see. 
so let's say Pete Buttigieg gets 20% of the overall, uh, you know, let's say Bernie gets 40% of the overall pledged, Buttigieg gets 20, Biden gets, you know, 15. Let's not make the math too complicated. Uh, but, you know, Klobuchar gets another 15 and uh, Warren gets 10. Then, you know, uh, Biden and Klobuchar might instruct their delegates to vote for Pete Buttigieg on the second round. And there might mm. be enough superdelegates to also vote for him that he could take it. Right. So, you know, there will be there will be backroom deals to figure out who's whose delegates are voting for for whom. Um, but, you know, the concern with that is that you get all of these people that were brought into the party, either from the left or as independents, they you have to keep them somehow engaged. If you're making the tent bigger and you're selecting someone from the very inside of the tent, then you need to keep those people on the fringes engaged so that they vote and so that they follow through and they canvass and they donate and do all of the activist things that you need done. That remains to be seen whether the party can do that. Um, and then going into the election, I think the most likely thing, outcome frankly, is for Donald Trump to win again. Uh, against I think the whom? Number, against whom? Uh, it will probably be one of the moderates. Oh, uh, really? Democratic Party. Yeah. I, it, it could be Michael Bloomberg. I don't think that's likely. It would be, he will. He would probably get a bunch of superdelegate support, but having a late entrant who is a former Republican mayor, uh, just hmm. it doesn't doesn't seem that's like so that. interesting. I thought you were going to predict that it was going to be Bernie versus Trump and then Trump would win. But you're, so you, so of the moderates, yeah. you think it's more like you think Buttigieg is the most likely of them of the moderates or Biden or Biden. Huh? Interesting. You know, a traditional politician will realize, listen, Bloomberg, you're not going to you're not going to win this right now. Um, but if you support me and use your vast resources to support my campaign. Um, I'll make you secretary of state. You can run again, you know, have right. some actual national public experience um, or make him VP, though I can't see him really taking that either. Yeah, I don't, I can't see that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So I, I guess for me, I think that it is quite likely that Bernie continues to get a lot of delegates, especially, you know, going into Super Tuesday. I don't know if he'll win California. I could see California going to uh, Bernie or Bloomberg potentially. But yeah, I mean, just to make it interesting, I'm going to predict that Bloomberg will win the nomination. And then my prediction of who will win the presidency is contingent on how the economy is doing. I think if the economy yeah. continues to do well, and it's Bloomberg versus Trump, I think people will vote for Trump and Trump will win. If the economy starts to falter and it, it uh, opens up some vulnerabilities where Bloomberg can say, look, you've been doing everything wrong. The economy's been falling. You've been lowering interest rates even before a recession. You've been increasing the deficit by billions of dollars a year. Put me in. I can fix it. Mike can get it done then I think that's a message that will resonate and I think Bloomberg will be the next president if the economy tanks before that happens. And, and uh, you know, they've, there's about a 33% chance there will be a recession in 2020, according to Ray Dalio and some of the big investment banks. So, I've heard, I think, I think the president and other policymakers close to him will probably try to forestall that. Yeah, uh, they already have started that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is a scary thought to think that the president can weigh in. I mean, also if if the president were to start some sort of war by that point, I mean that always shifts. Yeah, that'll get opinion. a lot of the news attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, we'll see. I mean, so far you've said that I've predicted everything correctly. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, know. I know. It's hey, dude. You've been predicting better than me so far. I mean, I thought Biden was going to be doing better than he is now. But I, I hadn't really considered Bloomberg until recently. So that's like a one of those curveballs that you, it's hard to predict. You know, it's an interesting possibility is and Mike Bloomberg, I don't want to say threatened this, but he alluded to this in 2016 was that if Bernie got the nomination, he would run third party and he could totally Ooh. do that. And he would screw 
everything up. I mean, you want to talk about just throwing a wrench into the electoral system that that happened. There was a similar dynamic in Maine in 2010 and 2014. Uh, there is a Republican governor there who's sort of a precursor, like a, a predecessor to Donald Trump in, in terms of how he relates to the public. His name is uh, Paul LePage. And he's he was he's pretty bad. Um, he's just said horrible things. He just comes across as just this bore. Um, but he won with about high 30s in actual like votes. Uh, but he won with a plurality um, between uh, an independent who also got low 30s and I think a Democrat that also got low 30s. So that could always happen. But, you know, you have to look at the electoral college math to really see uh, to really you know take it. And then there's the whole situation of if no one gets a clear majority of the electoral college, then it gets thrown to the House of Reps. Oh, and man. That's, I have that's no all. confidence in the recount process or, I mean, after Iowa, it just seems like, how can it be such a disaster? I mean, all you're doing is counting votes. Like there's got to be a simpler, more effective way to safeguard our elections. Yeah. I mean, Iowa and the Electoral College, man, those both deserve yeah. their own episodes. I wouldn't even, you And know. what do you think, like, I mean, just a final question, you know, Bill Maher has talked a lot about how even if Trump loses it seems fairly obvious that he would contest the results of the election, even if everything was done properly. So are you concerned about, you know, let's say Pete Buttigieg does win, but then Trump says, you know, we got to look into this. There's been some abnormalities just like there were with in Iowa. And then, you know, because he's got enough people on the inside, he can basically recount and say, oh, turns out I did win. Like, do you see that? Is that something you're concerned about? And like, what would be the right response for that? It cannot, in order to avoid that possibility, it can't be a tight race. Mm. Um, I mean, that's just, in order to avoid that, because that would be catastrophic. And and if that did happen, um, you know, each state handles how its electoral votes are allotted anyway. So there are enough states where the electoral infrastructure by that, I mean, who's controlling voting, the secretary of state for any particular state. There are enough Republican secretaries of state mm -hmm. who could potentially bring that up and say, uh, you know, we noticed some irregularities. We need to do a full recount. And right. and and that would be, you know, further constitutional crises that, yeah. you know, that we'd have to deal with. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, what would happen if if that were the case is. Uh, the House of Reps would decide that, you know, the Constitution allows for them to select uh, who would be president from the uh, top three electoral college vote recipients. And the way that works is that um, it's not that they vote as individual members of the House. So it's not 435 of them. It's that each state delegation votes. So to win the presidency, you would need uh you would need 26 um, state delegations to mm. vote for you. And I actually just looked into this, but I think the Republicans control 27 or maybe 26 oh, Pennsylvania's tied. That would be almost unheard of. I think the last time that happened was, I think it was the election of John Quincy Adams in the 1820s. Wow. So that would be pretty cool. I mean, not good at all, but interesting. Right. Yeah, it's amazing how many, how many future scenarios fork out in the political world. Like, so many corner cases have been considered. And that's why political strategy is like a very necessary profession for any campaign to win. Yeah, um, no, yeah. most definitely. Awesome. Well, yeah, we'll see how the predictions fare. Thank you, Brett, for joining us, as always. Yeah, and, thanks for having me. Talk yeah, about and thank you to our happened. listeners. This has been what the future of Bloomberg. And what will and inevitably we'll happen? Time. The past, the present, and the future. Our computers.